Okay, well, good morning again. Good morning. Good morning. Am I, uh, there we are. Uh, this time of year, sometime in December, I always like to do a little uh, piece on prayer treatment and how to do it because it is the tool, the primary tool that we use in our teaching. We certainly encourage people to meditate, and that would be the other half of that conversation within yourself is the meditation part is listening deeply, and, and the prayer part, the, the spiritual mind treatment part, is about planting those seeds of thought in your consciousness that enable you to move forward in your life, that enable you to have a, a greater experience of who and what you are. Now, Ernest Holmes, really the, the main, our founder, the main thing he added was this idea of spiritual mind treatment, because he didn't really create anything else in the philosophy. He took ancient wisdom and he combined it with what was then the emerging field of psychology in the West. And he recognized that in order to actualize this understanding of how we are as human beings, that we are spiritual beings. We have a spiritual aspect that is connected to everything. And our, most of our experience, however, is in the field of duality and seeing ourselves as separate from, as individual, as opposed to being all one. And he saw that psychology, the way we think, the way we use our mind, is the way that we can connect those two elements of ourselves in a more powerful way. So spiritual mind treatment was a way of using your psychology in order to create a, what we would call a psychological change, in other words, a new belief in your subconscious mind. So when we talk about prayer and prayer treatment, we're not talking about uh, asking an external deity or an external God to do something, we're talking about changing the mind of the one doing the praying. Because the essential element of this teaching is that that's all that has to change. That nothing else can change because everything else is part of an infinite that's already pre-existing. You might look at it this way. You have, everybody here has a future. And in that future are an infinite variety of possibilities. And you could take any string within your life, your, your professional life, your, your relationships, you know, your finances, your health. And within each one of those strings, there's a pretty much an infinite variety of possibility that can happen. You can express yourself in a variety of ways. And what determines that? What determines how your life unfolds? How you, not only what, what you do, but how you respond and react to what happens around you. And the answer is the way you think, the way you create beliefs within yourself determine how you express and how you respond and interpret, respond to and interpret the world around you. And we know that there isn't any one way to do that because everybody does it differently. You know, there's probably not one single topic on earth that everyone agrees on. Have you noticed that? You know, I mentioned Nelson Mandela, and he was relatively universally seen as a hero, but not by everybody. You know? And sometimes it's really jarring when you, when you have a kind of an idea about someone like that or something like that, and you meet someone with a completely different idea. And you're like, you know, what's going on there? Well, the answer is two distinct psychological paths to get to that, those differing beliefs. And those beliefs, once we form them, that becomes the most important thing in our life. It's less important what's actually factually true than it is what you believe about it. So spiritual mind treatment is a tool that you can use to expand your experience of what we would call good, what you would call good, and that might be different for every person to some degree. Now, it doesn't mean if you use treatment that nothing will ever go wrong in your life, that you won't have any problems, that you won't lose people. What it does mean is that you will have perhaps a higher platform or a deeper foundation within yourself with which to encounter those kinds of things. So it's not a, you know, it's, it's a get-out-of-jail-free card. It's not a get-rich-quick scheme. It is a way to, uh, 
create the life that you would desire to have as it unfolds. So, Norman Vincent Peale said, prayer doesn't change things for us, it changes us for things. And I think that's a good way to put it. You know, when I, when I was a little boy, I've mentioned this before, when I was a little boy, I was taught to pray to God to do something, give me something, you know. And I might pray for a new bike or a new wagon or a snow day. <laughs> prayed, prayed for those a lot. But, you know, when I said the prayer, I was expecting God, as I understood God, big, big old white guy up in the sky, <laughs> had a long beard. I was expecting him to do something different. In other words, to say, I wasn't going to do anything different. I was just asking for stuff. And I was, my expectation was that if God said yes to the prayer, that God would, you know, make the wagon happen or make the snow fall. And if he didn't, then that meant he said no to my prayer. See, and I would say in religion class, well, why would he say no to my prayer? Well, you must be a sinner. Okay, I'll grant you that. <laughs> I got no issue with that. But does that mean none of my prayers get answered? Yeah, because it seemed like sometimes they did and sometimes they didn't, you know? Anyway, so my idea, the idea was that what I understood prayer to be at that time in my life was that I was asking God or a saint or Jesus or whoever, you know, in that panoply of people you would pray to in the Christian tradition to do something for me that, you know, I wasn't intending to do anything different. I might, occasionally I'd bargain. You know, if you, if you make it snow tomorrow, I promise I won't, you know, do something. I, won't, I would not curse for a week or something, you know. That didn't seem to work out. <laughs> Alan Cohen says, prayer is the attunement of your mind with the blessing that already exists. See, this is back to the idea of spirit or God as an infinite source. That, and an infinite, you can't add anything to an infinite. That means if, if spirit is infinite, then everything must already exist within spirit. You can't bring anything new into it. The difference is, we would say, that, that some things exist as potential and others are actualized. And that what we do, kind of our, our role in the whole creative element of the universe, is to actualize certain elements of what it means to be human from that great field of potential into the narrower field of actualization. So when I say that you have all kinds of things possible in your future, what will happen is what you actualize, what gets actualized through your consciousness. The rest of it remains as potential. So I'm bringing myself into attunement or alignment with the blessing that already exists. The good is already there, but it needs a vessel for expression. So when I'm, to me, this is a very empowering idea because, you know, when I was a little kid praying for that bike, I had no idea where it was coming from. I was worried that, you know, the guys at the factory wouldn't make it or something unless, I, you know, you try to figure out, how's all that work? If I pray to God to get me a bike, and it's a Schwinn, that means somehow the Schwinn people have to be involved, right? And there has to be a bike store involved, and somehow it's got to get to my house. Now, I knew Santa Claus could do that, but what if it wasn't Christmas? How did it work? You know, you try to figure that out. Well, what this idea says, that it's already there, and I just have to come into alignment with it, is I don't have to worry about the creative process itself. I just have to work on acceptance. You know, as my teacher used to say, God's in manufacturing, I'm in sales. <laughs> I just have to sell myself on the idea that it's true and possible, and then as soon as I create that receptivity within myself, it manifests somehow. However, how? However it needs to. The universe is a cooperative venture. I don't have to know how. I don't have to concern myself with how. I just have to concern myself with really accepting at a belief level that what I desire is actually mine. 
And if you think about it, you probably have lots of stuff in your life, you definitely have lots of stuff in your life that you don't worry about being there, it's just there. You know? Well, how did, how did it get, how did, it, and it probably wasn't always there. Well, how did it get there to begin with? Well, you probably started with that place of not having it and wanting it and desiring it, and then it shows up, and then once it's there, it's fine. Well, what, what Holmes understood was you have to, if you get that attitude before it shows up, then it manifests that much more quickly. You know, the line in Matthew in the Bible, pray believing you have received and you shall receive. Pray believing you have received and you shall receive. In other words, you have to have the consciousness first and then the manifestation follows. Charles Hall is a minister up in uh, Seattle. He says, the time between when your prayer is uttered and its fulfillment is the spiritual work necessary for you to become its answer. Because sometimes we say, well, gee, how long is it going to take? You know. Well, in spirit, there is no time. In your subconscious mind, there is no time. Your subconscious mind doesn't exist in time or space. And by the way, you don't know, you don't know anything that's in it. It's subconscious. <laughs> the reason they call the subconscious the subconscious is because it's subconscious. So you don't know what's in it. You, only know, you can only see the results of what's in it. So how much time does it take? Well, let's say I'm doing my prayer treatment for a, uh, let's see, what would I like? Uh, it's Christmas time. Uh, I'd like a 2022 BMW. <laughs> well, that may take till 2021. That's usually when they come out, right? So there is, you know, so sometimes there are physical elements that have to do with delay, but in spirit there isn't any delay. I mean, spirit, there's no part of spirit saying, okay, hang on, hang on, hang on, get in line. It's, you know, we're busy here. No, that's not happening. Everything in spirit is only now. What sometimes causes a delay is my belief that there needs to be a delay or my belief that this is really a big problem. See, another thing spirit doesn't know is big or little. So sometimes if I get into my mind and I accept that this is a big problem, it's gonna take a lot of time to resolve, then what I do is I actualize that because I've accepted it as so. I've created a receptivity to delay. I've created a receptivity maybe to things having to be really difficult and complicated. So they are. And I say, see, I was right. <laughs> but when I say, see, I was right, I'm misunderstanding my own causative effect on the outcome. I'm looking at the outcome and say, well, that's the way it had to be, so that's probably the way it'll be next time. Instead of saying, well, wait a minute, why did I complexify it up so much? Why don't I just simplify it? next time. Because if I don't understand that I have this capacity, that I am in fact the causative agent in how my life shows up, then what I do is I act from a belief that things are happening to me rather than happening through me. And the universe says, fine, have it your own way. Really, the universe is an affirmative principle. So there's some steps to this process. This is, a, this is actually a process that we teach, and, and the steps are there for psychological purposes. That you're using your mind, and there's certain ways that you can use your mind that are more effective than others. You know, you can use your mind to worry. It is effective, by the way, just not in the direction you want it to be effective in. Worrying is like planning for what you don't want. Okay, anyone ever worried in here? Anyone, anyone, anyone? I was worried he'd ask that. You know? you know? 
Well, worried is kind of, it's sort of like negative goal setting. Now, the reason that everything you worry about doesn't happen is because you haven't developed your consciousness to a very strong level, which is probably a good thing if you're a worrier, because <laughs> all kinds of hell would be raining down on you, you know. <laughs> but when we turn it around to an affirmative, you know, if we think about what we want rather than what we don't want, and we learn to do that in a disciplined way, and by disciplined I don't mean, you know, like somebody's hitting you with a stick. I mean just doing it with intention and regular, because people are, oh, disciplined, I don't want to be disciplined, I want to be free. Well, you know. Well, you can only be free when you're disciplined. You know, you've got to train your mind to be very, very clear and direct. To understand what you want. See, a people with a trained mind are more careful what they say and what they think because they recognize the power in it. You know? So, these five steps of prayer are really uh, prayer treatment that Holmes developed. And actually, there's some question as to how the steps develop. Who cares? But, um, and there's also a seven step process. So the, the five step is called realization treatment and the seven step is argumentative and I'm going to tell you the difference in a minute. It's not that important but it, it has to do with how we process information. So Dr. Holmes says unless we understand the threefold nature of both humanity and the universe, and here's the threefold nature, as active consciousness which we call spirit, Receptive or creative law is the second thing, which we call the medium or universal subjectivity. That's your subconscious, is receptivity or subjectivity. And then manifestation. So you've got thought, conscious, subconscious, and manifest form. And that's the way it goes, sort of in a loop like that. So you think about, you think about stuff, you form beliefs in the subconscious, and the beliefs are what helps actualize things. You look at what's actualized, you think about it, and that becomes part of the process. Now the problem is most of us just look at what is and affirm it and then it stays the same. Rather than saying if I don't like what's there I need to think in a different direction and that manifest form will change. It's sort of like a, a way to look at it would be if you have a projector, you know, a movie projector, and it's, there's a light source, and the light source goes through the film and through the lens, and it puts the image on the screen. Okay, this is kind of a digital version of that. The, think of the light source as being spirit, the, the potential spiritual energy that's always flowing into you. The film strip is your belief system, and the screen is the manifest world. So, if, now, if I'm, if, if, let's say we've got gone with the wind on, okay, you're having a dramatic day, okay, so you're, you know, so you're, you know, you're having one of those kind of things, right? Now, as long as that film strip is gone with the wind, then Rhett Butler and all will be on the screen, okay? Now, if you change the film strip right away, like, say you have the two films spliced together, and you change it to, say, Psycho. Because somebody cut you off in traffic. <laughs> I, do, we owe, we, do we owe Bernard Herman any licensing for that? Um, what will be on the screen as soon as the new film comes through? Psycho, right? Because the light doesn't control what's projected, only that something is. The screen has no control over it, because the screen is just the receiver of the image. It's only the film that controls what is being shown. So if that film, you think of that as your consciousness, your subconscious, subjective mind, and the light is simply spirit shining through you, that animating force within you, and the world out here is your screen. And what's on the screen has to be supported by what's in your consciousness at any given moment. And when you change your consciousness, the world around you changes, at least to you. So that's what we're talking about here. So the idea is, if I don't like the film that's showing, I need to write a new script. 
I need to put something new in that subconscious place and then instantly, as soon as that is developed within me, not usually with the first thought, but over time as I think in a proper way, I get a new belief and the new belief then becomes active in my life. Okay. So the first step of, of spiritual mind treatment is the idea of what we call recognition and it's a statement all of these things are statements, they, they're words, but the words are designed to do something. They're designed to trigger in you a thought process, an image, a visualization of some kind, and then most importantly, an emotion. Because it's emotion that determines the impact of your conscious thoughts on your subconscious mind. The more emotion associated with a thought, the more powerful in creating belief. Now, a lot of times the emotion is just affirming an existing belief, and it makes that belief more strong, more strong within you. Sometimes you're, you're feeding a different, like let's just say, um, let's say you've had a, a condition over the last year or so of too much month at the end of the money. <laughs> Okay, so you've been kind of stressing about not having enough money, about things being difficult, and how am I going to do what I want to do and pay my bills and things like that. Maybe there's been some worrying, some fretting, some worst case scenario thinking, right? All of which has been doing what? The more, again, with a lot of emotion attached to it, building the belief that there isn't enough. Because that's kind of what you're affirming in that, in that moment. So let's say you start to do a treatment that looks like abundance. You know, you start to think in terms of, oh wow, I have plenty, I have enough to spare and enough to share, and you, you think about that. So what would it look like, see? What would it look like if you had enough to spare and enough to share? And you really want to do this, you really want to imagine your life being sufficient or sufficient plus. So where does it not look like enough now? Well, maybe when you sit down to pay the bills. And maybe, you know, you might be digital or analog. You might be writing in a checkbook or you might be doing it online. So you would imagine, what would it look like if I'm sitting there, you know, on my online banking account, and as I fill in the amounts for each check, I have a, I ha and just pick an ideal figure. And the balance is like, there's plenty left. What would that look like? Now you can imagine what it would look like in your checkbook. You can imagine when you, you know, you fill in the visa bill and you just paid and you look over and there's a whole bunch of money. Just in your imagination, what would that look like? You can, you can do that, right? Yeah. You know, pick a number. You know, I don't know, what would be comfortable? Suppose $100 billion. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, no, it probably needs to be something that's at least halfway believable. So. I don't know, 10,000 as an example. And you'd say, okay, can I imagine 10,000? Not really. So, okay, make it five. Okay. But what you do is you would imagine paying your bills and seeing that amount left for you to do whatever you want with. And then here's the key. What would that feel like to know that was true? That's the key. Can you imagine feeling like you had that? You see? Can you imagine waking up and being completely healthy? What would that feel like? Can you imagine being in an amazing relationship with your soulmate? Well, maybe you already are. Okay. But can you imagine? What would that feel like? So that's what I'm talking about. This is, the, this is what you do. You, you create some words that give you a, a thought process, an image and a feeling that match what it is you desire. So the first thing is God is. What's the best, what best idea I can have about the nature of God or spirit? And you don't have to use the word God if you don't like the word God. God doesn't care what you call it. It doesn't know what you're calling it, actually. The purpose is to create a condition in your mind, a feeling that I am surrounded by and immersed in unconditional love. So what would I need to say and picture and feel to actually get that sense? You know? 
So one thing, you're probably going to have to get, the Old Testament God's probably got to go. You know, not a, not a very touchy-feely kind of a guy, right? <laughs> you know. And, and if you, you know, some people, well, I want to have a personal idea of God. Okay, well, use the one Jesus used. That was pretty good. He talked about a God of incredible forgiveness and love, of opulent joy and abundance. You see? That only lasted a while, then Paul came in and brought back the Old Testament God because that seemed to work better in organizing a religion. But what Jesus talked about, if you look at the way Jesus described God, it's beautiful. See, or just being a supportive energy. See, so what can I do? How can I conceptualize this idea and feel a feeling that helps to put me into a place where I feel like I'm surrounded by, immersed in a system of unconditional love? Why do that, you might say? because I'm getting ready to make a demand on the universe and I want it to be a friendly one. So the, the sec, I'm not gonna do that right now, we'll skip that. Forget denial. Skipping ahead, and nah, nah, this will make a short talk. So the second step is unification. This is I am, and this is where I I'm, I'm, I'm really wanna build myself up as being worthy powerful, whatever qualities I need so that I can accept greater good. Because the biggest problem in our lives, for the most part, is we can't accept greater good. We don't think we deserve it. We don't think we've earned it. We don't think, you know, whatever. So this is a very important step. The purpose is to create a consciousness of radical self-acceptance. Now, you know, most of us have been discouraged from doing this most of our lives. You know, we've been told by others and authority figures over the years that we should know our place, which was somewhere south of them, right? <laughs> and we've kind of bought into that. I think it's partly human nature, too. So this is important. In order for me to, to accept my good fully, I have to see myself as one with that divine presence I have just described and fully worthy of good. So, you might spend some time on this step. Matter of fact, I recommend everybody as part of their daily practice have a whole treatment just about this, just about self-acceptance, because most of us have some stuff to overcome there. So, first two steps. God is fantastic, wonderful, joyous, giving. I am one with that great giving spirit. I am worthy of my good. And I want to be worked up into a metaphysical frenzy at the end of this step. I may look totally calm on the outside, but inside, man, oh, I've got it going. I'm on the top shelf emotionally, as high as I can get up in that inner cabinet. I'm in a great space. Because the next thing I'm going to do in step three is I'm going to go into realization. I'm going to make a claim, a demand, for something greater to manifest in my life. See, a spiritual mind treatment is not a begging of a deity for something new. It's a demand on a lawful universe. Purpose is to create a consciousness of perfect realization. Realization of what? Whatever the hell it is you're treating for. Health, wealth, relationship, creative self-expression, those are the general categories. You may be treating for someone else's well-being or benefit. You know. How can you ask for something greater than, than there is if you haven't created within yourself that receptive space to allow for that to be? Because it was just a matter of accepting the greater good. Wouldn't you just do that already? Well, if you're not doing it, something's in the way, and it isn't spirit. It's you. It's me. As Emerson said, we have to get our bloated nothingness out of the way and let the divine circuits flow. There is nothing stopping spirit from flowing through you in magnificent, opulent ways except your current failure to accept that. To ex or, or your, your decision at a conscious and subconscious level to accept something less. 
It says, treatment is the science of inducing within mind, that's capital M, that's the big mind, concepts, acceptances, and realizations of peace, poise, power, plenty, health, happiness, and success, or whatever the particular need might be. So I'm putting these ideas into my subconscious mind, which is connected to the one mind, and by being in my subconscious mind as a dominant belief, which means it's got a lot of energy in it, that's where the emotion comes, whatever is the dominant belief in your system or ser series of beliefs, that is what manifests. Okay. Now part of it is sometimes we're not real careful how we talk to ourselves. How we say, you ever call yourself an idiot? <laughs> how could I be such an idiot? Right? Or something like that. If you had friends that talked to you the way you talk to yourself sometimes, how long would they be your friends? <laughs> See? And what we, we do that because we don't, we don't realize that every thought is creative. Every thought is creative. Maybe you had a critical parent, you know, maybe. Just, I'm, I'm taking a shot that in here there's a couple of people <laughs> that maybe had critical parents. And you see, you know, and you may not live with them anymore. They may not even be around anymore. But so often we take over and become that critical parent to ourselves because we just got in the habit of it, you see. And, and what happens when I say, what's the matter with me anyway? With that emotion, I, I build that belief to where it's dominant. And the universe just operates through that because that's what it does. So I could pray to the universe not to operate through my negative dominant beliefs, but that doesn't work because you, you can't make the universe go against its nature. So if I know what its nature is, which is to move through my dominant beliefs and bring them into manifest form, it, wouldn't it be in my best interest to create some better dominant beliefs? And that's all we're talking about. So the possibility of demonstration does not depend, listen, this is really important, does not depend, demonstration is a positive result from the prayer treatment. The possibility of demonstration does not depend on environment, condition, location, personality, or opportunity. There goes all your excuses. <laughs> Isn't it empowering not to have excuses? It depends upon our belief and our acceptance and our willingness to comply with the law through which all good comes. If you don't comply with the law in a good way, the law will work in what turns out to be a bad way. The law, it's the same law that the farmer goes out and puts a seed in the ground, you know. The seed has the idea, that's the thought, the thought contains within it the idea, you plant it in the creative medium, which for the farmer is the soil, for us is the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind produces the idea that's in the seed. It can't produce anything else from that seed. So who determines what plants grow? the farmer who plants the seed. See, if the farmer goes out and plants corn and complains because carrots don't grow, <laughs> he's not working with the law properly. The law's working just fine, see? But when, when, when we as human beings go on these negative sprees as part of our regular daily routine and then wonder why our life isn't working, are we any smarter than the farmer that's planting corn and expecting carrots? I can't tell you how many times I've counseled people and talked to people who say, I don't understand it. I'm the most positive person I know. <laughs> I say, well, you've got to get some new friends. Because, <laughs> honey, you're not very positive. How can I tell? Because your life's a mess. <laughs> you know, it's like the farmers. I don't understand why I'm getting all this corn. I, you know, I really <laughs> intend carrots. <laughs> yeah, honey, but you're planting corn. <laughs> There is a cause and effect here. And you, you know, there isn't any, the other thing is there isn't anybody to fool. You know, when I was a kid, I used to think I could fool God because, you know, Adam and Eve hid from him in the garden. He couldn't find them, remember, in Genesis? So I figure I can hide from God. 
That didn't work either. There isn't any God to hide from. It's just the law. What's that old song? I fought the law and the law won. <laughs> Fourth step is gratitude, thanksgiving. I'm grateful in the treatment for what is to come. I'm grateful in advance to create a consciousness of perfect expectation. See, this helps to reinforce the belief that I'm, I'm generating what I'm generating. I'm accepting the greater wealth, the greater health, the greater whatever it is. Why? Because I'm grateful for it in advance. I'm not going to wait until it shows up. That would show a lack of trust. I'm grateful now because I'm, I'm expecting it. And again, I've said this a million times, how much faith do I have to have? The same faith in your prayer treatment or your affirming thought that you have in the light switch when you turn it on that the light will come on. In other words, you'd be surprised if it didn't. So when you do a prayer treatment and it, and it demonstrates, and you're surprised it demonstrated, you've got some work to do to get to the point where, of course, my treatments demonstrate. If they don't, I go, what? How did that happen? You know, you do a double take. Like when the light doesn't go on, oh, what happened? You know, I'm so surprised. I would use your car as an example, but some of you are surprised when it does start. <clears throat> And then step five is release, it's to let go. It doesn't mean we're not going to think about the issue anymore. It means I'm not going to get into the realm of worrying and overanalyzing and things like that. I want to create a consciousness of perfect trust. We only analyze what we don't trust. That was me as a little kid. I had to figure out how the whole prayer thing worked to where I said, give me a bike and I got a bike. I didn't trust it. Couldn't see it. Right? And this God that I understood at that time was pretty shifty. <laughs> well, he wasn't the Bible. Read Job. Right? Read Abraham. So, prayer treatment is a process of doing a series of directed thoughts that are three dimensional in nature their words, their images and their feelings. And you put them all together and you do, it's like a, it's like a big stack of, of great visualization that you do in sets of five, and maybe you do four or five of them in the morning because you've got four or five things you're treating about. And at the end of that 10, 15 minutes, you've put a lot of positive energy into your subconscious. Okay, and then the job begins of not going out and screwing that up the rest of the day by falling back into the negativity. So the steps are recognition, a consciousness of unconditional love, unification, a consciousness of radical self-acceptance, realization, a consciousness of perfect realization, gratitude, a consciousness of perfect expectation, and release for a consciousness of perfect trust. That's what we want to do. Holmes says, we cannot demonstrate beyond our ability to mentally embody an idea. That's called alignment. You may get more than you can handle, and you won't handle it well. The consciousness has to match. Okay, so that's our little lesson on prayer treatment. I hope you found it valuable. And, uh,